Yes, I'm Andrew Curry. I've played centre for Witness for 11 or 12 years, possibly. Hume to Holiday. Good ball to Alan Church. He's got space. He's got Curry with him. Oh, yes, the gap was there. You'd never thought you'd play for Witness. You just played with your mates, and then all of a sudden you get asked to come down, and um, it was like all your dreams come true. I never thought it was ever good enough to do that, but it happened. Me and Paul Hume are in the same team. We played for Holton Hornets. This man can go, it's a try, nobody needs to bother. Witness was, it was probably bigger than when I, when I was playing. They were, they were legends from Nick Adams and Mike O'Neill, Reg Bowden and everything. These were just like fantastic people. They were just, you, you know, you looked at them in and all. And as I said, and then at 16, all of a sudden, I'm sure my dressing room changed, you, you know, you don't think you belong with them. Always a, a point of discussion. Good start here, Darren Wright pops inside now to Alan Tate. He's got men on the outside. Courier looks for support, he looks for Davis, uses the long ball to Darren Wright. Oh, that's a magnificent effort in these conditions. And we were all fantastic to me. How did he put up with me for so many years until like um, I got my head straight, I don't know, but they were just fantastic, fantastic people. I played anywhere in the backs, really, anywhere I could get in, but I was most comfortable playing standoff. I signed 73. Three. It was before the 66 World Cup, so, so he went on a school field round here. Nobody was playing football, they were playing taking pass or rugby. When I left school, um, the place to go was the Rugby Union Club. All the, all the best local players went there in the absence of a good amateur team to, to join, really. And played it like rugby league, really. It wasn't played like traditional rugby union. Vinci approached me because he said he didn't want to lose any more local lads to other teams. I think Witness has always been a hotbed for rugby league talents, you know, for, forever and a day. From back when Dennis signed, my brother's six years older than me, but I, he signed for Witness in 66. The amateur game in the town was doing well, and Witness lads just wanted to play for Witness, you know, and um, the club used to sign regularly every every season local lads, two or three local lads who'd done well in um, amateur rugby league. So there was a whole host of people who signed, Eric Hughes, Mick McLaughlin, George Nichols, John Foran, Chief Elwell, Reggie Borden. You could go on and on and on and they were all local lads who played amateur rugby league in the town in most cases. In 84, I played a couple of games that year but I was only a kid, as I say again, very naive. But then a lot of players retired from Medicus, um, I think Les Gawley, after the 84 final. Oh, Auckland. Oh, my goodness, he's got a gap. Out to John Bastard, he's got the inside. Oh, he's got it. Yes. Well, a try from nothing. So Eddie come in charge, um, and he started putting putting his in. All the young kids like me, Dan and Wright and things like that. And then Dougie just stuck with us. I mean, You've got to have some um, something about you to to recognise from rich years, Paul Hume, and he stuck with us for the for the year or two and now like and all these kids were coming through and they were all over St. Helens Lee or Witness all come through the, through the academy. Dougie bred it, you know, integrated it, I mean, um, with some fantastic big name players, Jonathan Davis. I mean had the pick of some rugby union players as well, Moriarty, Deborah, you know, and Tatey and a couple of, you know, we're mostly close, so we was mixed but but the, the backbone of the team was the two youngers, was Mike O'Neill, Steve O'Neill. You know, these rock hard, fantastic pedigree, knowledgeable witness lads. When you look back at witness when we were really successful, there was a core of, uh, they weren't just homegrown, but they were, un they were unbelievable players, the Hume brothers, you know, the Milers, the O'Neills, uh, even like Barry Dowd, people like that, uh, all homegrown players that came through. Players like them could have gone, Come to other clubs, but they choose to come to witness. And that's how it's always been. Before that, it was 
Reggie and Eric and Mick Adams, and it, it was always the same. My name's Danny Craven, I'm a halfback for Witness Vikings and I've played here for the last 12 years. Uh, yeah, so originally I was on scholarship at St Helens and they were going on a tour to, to Australia. They decided to go with someone else in my position and um, I was sort of really disheartened by that and I was on an whether to, to leave the game and it was a letter that came through my mum's address when I was living at my mum's from uh, Cranston College and it was Phil Finney, they were starting up a rugby academy and, Asked me if I wanted to go down. Went to college and within six months I was training training with the first team at Witness. Well, my first memory for Witness was playing the town team um, under Roger Harrison. So that's uh, school bars when we were we were in school year six. We must have been about 11. The vast majority of us all played Fulton Hornets, which was me amateur club growing up. We played for, for 10 years. Academy, we was, even though we were in the championship, we were still competing against all the Super League teams when I was here. Uh, so. We'd play against the likes of Saints, Leeds, Warrington, uh, Hull KR, Hull. And my age group, we were probably one of the best teams. You know, talent-wise, we wasn't, but we had a sort of togetherness that was instilled in us. My first real memory of an actual academy and, you know, feeling like a professional set was when, was when Phil came in. So I was part of the club going from um, Championship into Super League. Initially, we set a target of having 20 players get into our first team squad by 2020. So this was in 2010, 2011, we developed this strategy. Um, so it was very long term. So the best possible witness kids, we would we would try to um, influence them and try and get them to love the club really. We, we changed it and modified it to 20 players getting in the first team by 2020, but importantly, they had to play 20 games at a competitive level, which was either League games or Challenge Cup games. Of note, uh, and, pe and you know, that people would know about straight away, obviously Danny Craven was one. Uh, he's our longest serving player. Jack Owens, the club captain, is one. And then there's other players like Alex Gerrard, who's, who's still playing at Salford now. Uh, Danny Walker, playing at Warrington. Matt Whitley at Catalans. Um, Brad Walker, he, he was playing at Wakefield. When the licensing come about, and you know, we got the, the promotion to go into Super League, I was in and around the first team at that point. Um, there was a few of us from, from the academy who began to train. There was a feeling around the place that, you know, we're, we're going on to sort of bigger and, and better thing as it was because there was a three year licensing. We played Wakefield here the first game in 2012 and I think I was going to be in the squad but not in the playing squad uh, and Sean Briscoe pulled out of, of the team quite late in the week and he came and told me himself that I was going to be playing there so I sort of, I didn't really have long to process it, it was, it was a Friday night game and uh, I was lucky to score a try in that game as well. But with the excitement come uncertainty um, no one really knew what was going to happen. We'd started the season 2019. We'd played Halifax at home, which was a tough game to lose away the second game, and we won both of them. I'd just signed back, so I'd left in 2000 and end of 15, 2015, come back in 2019. But the year before, I'd gone through some trouble myself at Lee. Um, Derek Beaumont was threatening to put the club into administration. Really in between what I wanted to do with rugby, um, met with Phil, ended up signing back. Um, had a really good pre-season, again, buzz around the place. Fast forward a few months to start the season. An absolute high from a player's point of view. We were, you know, we were going to challenge for the for the championship. Um, and we played Toronto at Newcastle. So we, we found out travelling up there that something was about to, to happen financially at the club. and. We didn't know the ins and outs of it. You know, we knew that the previous CEO had, had resigned and I think he was working his three months notice, uh, but wasn't really about at that point. Um, and I was trying to sort lads out who required medical treatment, whether it was scans or surgeries. And I kept on getting told that it's been put off. Can he book him in next week? And so I started to get a few alarm bells at, at this point. I was driving home one night and got a phone call. Um, Obviously, they were trying to sell the club at that point. 
they wanted new investments coming to the club. And I got a, a phone call asking me what I meet a couple of um, business consultants. And bear in mind my background was performance. It wasn't anything to do with with, a biz, with running businesses or, or finance. And I, so I came into the meeting and, and what to, the business consultants turned out to be administrators. So they'd been appointed to, to essentially come in and put the club into administration. There was murmurs of, you know, what's happening. Um, the club's going to administration. Um, it even could be liquidation. Obviously, we don't know the legal side of how it works. Just there, the words administration and liquidation. And Phil's trying to explain the situation about how administrators are going to be, you know, taking over the club. They basically told us that we couldn't train. They they saw the players as assets, and if they could be sold, then they would be. When the administrators were appointed, you know, they're effectively running your club at that point, um, and you know, they were looking at recouping money, essentially. I just remember all being sat in a circle, all the players, and a few people got called in to meet the administrators. Um, you heard them leave the room. A number three players then got called in. Um, it then soon, you know, become apparent what was happening, and we knew we, we knew they were going to be made, be made redundant. Yeah, I think it was pretty much they were sat in a room, and the lads who were being made redundant were asked to go into a separate room and told they were they were going, and that happened to staff as well. So there was a couple of young players that were sold in Jared O'Connor and Sam Walters. They were sold to Leeds. Uh, the administrators got that money. The club doesn't get that money. The way that happened was was quite awful, to be fair. Um, you know, they were both, but two witness kids, uh, come through our academy programme, been associated with the club from being 10, 11, uh, probably on the cusp of becoming first team players with us. And they were sort of taken into uh, the, the office in front of everybody and asked to sign, you know, release, forms um, and if I'd have been aware of that I wouldn't have personally I wouldn't have let that happen because both kids were in tears you know what I mean to see people being released from the contracts in front of you it's yeah it was soul destroying and on a personal point of view I was just panicking thinking oh, right, am I gonna get called into this room next of just felt love with the sport a little bit Lee enjoy it and like I said I enjoyed the start of it bit of a bit of a bad ending so starting to fall out of love with the sport uh, met with Phil they sat, you know, agreed that I, I wanted to come in, that was it. Got sorted, buzzing, and then went from the biggest high of starting the season well to thinking, oh God, this could be the end, <laughs> this could be the end of witness light, and I didn't know what I was going to do from there. And obviously not knowing financially whether you're going to be paid or or even if the club's going to exist, you know, on, on, a, on a wider scale, a club like witness to potentially not exist was, you know, it's inconceivable as, as a business and as a club. And like I said, for the for the club members of staff and the few players who got made redundant, it's just like, the world's just been blown up on it. That week, 10 days, was was the worst. I can't even imagine what it was like for the backroom staff. A um, few of us, me, Gilly, JJ, Brad, Ollie, um, quite a lot of lads come down to be fair to them, can't remember everyone who's in there, but you know, we're all, we're all on the phones in the office speaking to speaking to scene ticket all us, being to supporters, you know, trying to rally round and, and get some help from the club. And When the club was then bought essentially from the administrators, um, that was, we, we, it was pretty much rushed through. Um, and this is, you learn things after the event, you know, when you're in the midst of, we're all trying to save the club from liquidation to make sure the club's here. You know, let, you're not really thinking too clearly, you're just trying to get the job done and. It was rushed through essentially because the RFL needed us to play on the Sunday. We'd already had the Sheffield game cancelled the week before. So and we were all pushing back, like how can you play when you've not trained all week? And and anyway, the, the game ended up going ahead. But in all honesty, at that point, um it was just obviously relief that the club had been saved. And then it was the reality then hit in the next couple of days that you put all your effort into saving the club, but then the, rea the, the harsh reality is you're on your own and you just got to crack on and start trying to make the club work. It was a real shame because we had a, a really, really good group of, of players that year and I, I genuinely thought we could have achieved something that year as well. Obviously at that point, you know, we, we felt that it would be a more um, ethical and moral thing to do to disband the academy rather than try and carry on running it and not knowing full well that we, we weren't running it properly. 
the timing was awful. You know, we made it a week before Christmas. It was, you know, it was it was horrendous having to make that decision. Um, but the reality is that, you know, you, to run an academy effectively, you have to resource. You have to be able to resource it. Um, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't have to cost the earth, but you have to have the most important thing is the people. You know, you're trying to develop. You're trying to, first of all, you're trying to identify lads that have got the potential to be Super League players and full-time professional athletes. And then secondly, you've got to put them in an environment where you've got staff capable of developing them. And it's not, it's a very, very different, um, it's a very different way of working than you would with professional foot adults. But we're, we're in a position now where there's an, obviously an academy um, and you know, you go down and there's Holton on, it's more field, there's West Bank and St. Ellen's might take so many, uh, Waterton might take so many, Wigan probably not as much of it being a little bit further afield, but you know, where do all these kids go once, once you don't get picked up by one of these, you know, so-called super clubs or top-end super league clubs, you know, um, at the end of the day, oh, they can only sign so many. It's, it's heartbreaking, to be honest with you. Um, you know, the the staff, as Phil especially, has put a lot of time and effort into the academy programme here, and it was it was obviously successful as well. The amount of lads who've come through the system here, and uh, the amount of lads who would have as well. Um, you only have to look at the lads from Witness playing in Super League now. You've got Matt Percival, Danny Richardson, Lewis Dodd. You know, there's there's lots of it. Harry Smith's another one. Um, they're all Witness lads. The potential impact that 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 has on on young players' ability to find a route into rugby league. And in a town like Widnes where there's, you know, high levels of deprivation and not an awful lot of opportunities to be like a nine, ten year old involved in something like that, it gives you a bit of status and confidence and self esteem and inspires you to want to do something. We had people here who wanted to be here and wanted to develop and be part of something special and about the Academy of Doubt. Well, no, I know, I know there's a very, very good chance that I won't be in this position now. Surely, you know, you've got to have the, the basics of an academy coming through, because that's that's how Dad and Ray come through. That's how Dave Hume, Paul Hume, Mike and Neil, it all comes through. Is the sport going to lose uh, a pool of talent, you know, from witness? Because at the minute, we haven't got anything to probably inspire them. As a collective, we... We, we definitely saved the club alongside the board um, who, who are in place now. Um, alongside them, the fans, like I said, sponsors, players helping out. Just some of the, some of the things that would happen, you know, fans just turning up, little kids donating pocket money and piggy banks. and You know, with the, the support of the community of Witness and the wider rugby community, we sort of banded together and came out the other side of it. And, you know, that, that year we went to Wembley. But you listen to the atmosphere and you get here and this is what it's all about. Here come the teams. Lee led out by Mickey Hyam. As Chris Dean leads out the Witness Vikings in the black and white. We played in a cup competition. Um, you know, it was the first year it was up from running. Um, we, we set out to say we wanted to win it. And I remember the semi-final draw and just thinking, why, you know, why have we got Lee? Lee with uh, Derek Bowman owning them, I think. You know, they, he'd also sponsored the 1895 Cup. It was the first year that that competition had been introduced and he was the headline sponsor of it. So, you know, I think they were quite keen on winning it. But I think you just knew after about five minutes that we were going to be in the game and we're going to have a really good chance of winning. Well, look where they are still, Witness. That was a big shot as well. They wanted a swinging arm, the Witness fans, and it. now it's They're on! Into it. They're into it. It's all kicking off early. Throughout the game, um, it just became apparent that we weren't. You know what I mean? We were in a really, you know, we stood a really good chance of winning the game. Can they get the ball away and find the spaces on this right-hand touchline? Gelling is screaming the for ball. it. They've got past Gelling and they're scoring the corner. Oh, he put him in touch. He's pulled the flag, he's in touch. Oh, it's a brilliant piece of defending. It looked for all the money as if Ryan Ince had scored. What was good for, really good for, for me personally and I think a lot of the people that have been involved in the club for a long time as you know a hell of a lot of academy players played that day uh, the try that we scored the only downside was Anthony Gelling scored it because I think every involvement leading up to that 
was a Witness Academy lad involved in it. So I think JJ Keen and Brand were involved in it. I think Danny Craven again was involved in that. And then it should have really been Inti to catch it and score, but it wasn't. It was Anthony Gelling. But you know, we'll take that. He was good for us that he year. Might not be far off. Oh, good dummy. Craven, 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 Craven. Craven. Now then. Oh, Van is free on this near touch line. He's gone away from inside. Can Johnson. he take the pass? He has Johnson. He kicks he's it. Kick over to the far side. Gelling's going to catch. And Anthony Gelling. And he'll score. Brilliant try. And it's the man of the people, Anthony Gelling, who gets the fans on their feet. It was a, it was quite a rainy day at Utley that day, and uh, yeah, just I, I just called the player to Jack, and he was on the fly, and we ran, we ran through with the play, and Jack ran straight through. Thinking 15 to go, we score again. We're almost there. Yeah, we just need to, to for me, they just need to look to try and get his ball in goal. If they don't score a try, put the ball in goal. That's the next next best thing. Great ball out the back, Craven. Oh, oh, that's a great through. line as well, and he's through. Look at the toes. Oh, he's he oh, yes, he can. What a try. Jack Owens with the blistering toes. And is that the score that sends the Vikings to Wembley? To see the fans erupt the way they did behind the sticks was just, you know, that that made your hair, hairs on the back of your neck stand up. So to score that, to score off that play in that um, in that environment, that setting, it was, I believe it was quite fitting. And, was a was a nice touch and a nice way to help lead us onto onto the final. I sort of lay on the floor. I was exhausted and probably one of the highlights of my career, winning that game. There you go. And there's the Hooter. Witness are off to Wembley, and look what it means to them. They sprint to their fans and celebrate with their fans. Wow. It's the Vikings' day in league. A special, special moment. Look at those scenes over to our left-hand side. This is this is after a semi-final of the 1895 Cup. It was just a real togetherness and a real want to win together. And that's what made the final so upsetting, was the fact that we did that with Lee and we were buzzing. And then to not come away with, with the trophy at the end of it was disappointing. But yeah, I don't think we'll get a feeling again like I did at that semi-final against Lee. Uh, probably 90% of the people would have thought uh, Lee were going to do us. I think everyone knew the importance of what it meant to everyone who could make the game, people who couldn't make the game supported. And I think getting to Wembley that year probably saved us to a certain extent. I think we were on a really slippery slope at that point and how we beat Lee at, at Lee in that semi-final, I'll never know, do you know what I mean? All the stars aligned that day and we beat them and it was an un unbelievable performance kind of thing. Admin to Wembley in the space of a year, that was that was a big a big part of that year as well. You know, sometimes there's a bigger picture and uh, there's, there's some things going on behind the scenes which no one's ever going to know about. Us as players aren't going to know about, but you just get a feeling around the environment. You know, since I've supported this club, there's been, I suppose, lots of like false dawns and um, lots of promises around the club that we've never really delivered on. And I, and I do think genuinely a part of that has been the financial instability of the club. I think, and this isn't to make excuses for us because you know we we are where we are we you know we can't change the fact that we're witness vikings you know we should be really really proud we're in a town like witness i think now we're probably in a bit of a rebuilding phase you know i think the aim for us is to sort of build a team that are going to be competitive at the the top end of the championship rather than scraping playoffs if if we're lucky so um for us now we've just got to look on an upward sort of trajectory and um, aim to be getting in them playoff spots regularly. The last three years it has been about, really about sort of um, learning about the sport and learning it from a business perspective, learning how, the, how, how professional sport uh, runs and identifying and trying to plot a route forward. We've had our two years of experimenting now, it's, um, we're in the middle now to finish this season strong, look forward to next year and especially with all these rumours around structural change and what's going to happen to the sport you know we need to be we need to be putting ourselves uh, in a good position uh, at the end of 2023. To be honest with the way we've been performing since you know since round four of this season it's not been acceptable and we've lost a lot of games that we shouldn't have lost against teams who shouldn't be beating us so I think the only way for us now is to start progressing up the the championship table and you know we've brought John in now he's got a wealth of experience he's won pretty much everywhere he's been. He's had success everywhere he's been, so hopefully he can instill a bit of a better mentality into 
the team. And look, I, I'll be totally honest, I think he's perfect for what we need right at this minute in time. For where the club's at, for the people we have on the other side, you know, Ryan O'Brien, uh, who was interim for a bit. Unbelievable coach. Um, I do really believe him and John can work well together. And we've been a, a proper part-time team now for two years. 2021 playing, what, two, two, was it two thirds of the season behind closed doors? It was something like that, weren't it? You know, so this is the first year now I'd say, boy, it's like, right, everything's been wiped clean. We're starting again now. We, we certainly in the future want to, um, want to be working with young people, want to be trying to help people fulfil their potential to go on and, and hopefully have careers in the sport or just engage in the sport and receive all the benefits that you do from playing a team sport, all the behaviours and uh, habits that you you um, have instilled in you from applying yourself into in a sporting environment. We definitely want to get back involved with that. What that will look like, I'm not entirely sure. I think we have to see what the restructure um, and what IMG suggest. But I think Witness as a, as a town you know, some of the, as I've just mentioned before, some of the really pivotal players in some Super League clubs have come from this town. So I think there still needs to be something um, that Witness as a town offers to the sport. What Witness has done for me is just give me, like, friends friends for life, really. Uh, and people who, um, it doesn't matter how long it is since you last met them, you just kick off again just like it was yesterday when you'd last seen him, but it might be a year or so. It was just everything you, you learned every day. You never stopped laughing. You never. You were very fit, you trained all, all the time. The fans have been always been great with me and I've had two children here who love coming to watch the dad play for Widness, so that's, that's all that I need. And for me, Widness is the club that gave me the opportunity to, to fulfil me my goal, which was to play Super League. And as long as Widness want me to stay here, then I want to stay here as well. I'd love to finish the rest of my career here.